So let's now take a look at some of the challenges in the design of high performance clock distribution networks. In typical modern SERTI systems, there's one PLL clock source that's shared among multiple parallel lanes of serializers and deserializers, which may collectively be called a macro. Um, the PLL is, this picture is located here, and the clock from that PLL has to be distributed a significant distance across the macro, typically hundreds of micrometers or even a millimeter or more. So therefore, a number of challenges are introduced in this clock distribution network. There's timing uncertainty introduced, random jitter, RJ, duty cycle distortion, DCD, and power supply induced jitter, PSIJ, can approach or even exceed the timing uncertainty that arises in the generation of the clock in the VCO and the PLL itself. The buffers required to distribute the clock this long distance can consume a significant fraction of the link power, especially when we're talking about very short reach, simple transceivers, such as Horizon Dye to Dye interfaces. Now, as we go to higher and higher sampling rates, the jitter budget tightens and the performance of this clock distribution has to become higher and higher and generally its power consumption increases even further. So the design of the clock distribution becomes more and more critical. There's a few different common ways to distribute a CMOS clock across a CERTES macro. The most traditional approach is to use CML clock distribution, current mode logic, where a clock is distributed differentially, typically across a controlled impedance on die transmission line, terminated with its characteristic impedance um, to ensure that the traveling wave clock along here maintains its amplitude. Um, however, we increasingly see the use of CMOS clocking, which offers several advantages over CML clocking. Now we've got dynamic power consumption only. There's no resistive loads here, only capacitive loads are being driven. No biasing circuits are required. All that's being used is CMOS inverters for the buffers. Uh, they produce full swing clocks with very fast rise and fall times, which we'll see are good for low jitter clock distribution. They offer the potential for dynamic power scaling. As we decrease the clock frequency, the power consumption will automatically decrease in proportion, and we can decrease the power consumption even further if we lower the supply voltage on the buffers. The circuits are very simple and they scale well in advanced CMOS technologies. No matter what happens with CMOS technology scaling, we can pretty much guarantee that it'll be possible to make a pretty good inverter in future CMOS technologies. But a significant disadvantage of CMOS clock distribution is that uh, they're quite susceptible to power supply noise. CMOS buffers both create supply noise and are sensitive to it. So that's a primary challenge that we'll talk about. Another alternative that's being increasingly used in very high speed links is resonant clock distribution. By taking advantage of LC resonance in the passive distribution lines, this offers the lowest possible power consumption among these approaches. Um, it creates a tuned circuit that can therefore actually filter out jitter, which is quite intriguing. However, a fundamental trade off there is that the clock distribution network is now narrowband, so it can't be used for legacy lower frequency data rates uh, over the same circuits. So let's focus on power supply induced jitter now, specifically in CMOS clock distribution networks. Supply fluctuations introduce jitter in a CMOS buffer by modulating the gate delay through the inverter. When the supply noise is small, it can be shown that the gate delay variation, also referred to as PSIJ, is proportional to the supply noise magnitude. So that is, if we modulate the supply up and down by an amount delta VDD, we expect the delay through the inverter to change by an amount delta T that is proportional to delta VDD. This can be derived with some simplifying assumptions but in fact, the trend is very, very accurately held across many different device sizes and capacitive loads shown here uh, in these simulation results in a 16 nanometer FinFET technology.
So the idea is that the percentage change in the delay through the inverter is proportional to the percentage change in the supply voltage of the inverter. The constant of proportionality here is K. And it turns out K is independent of the size of the buffer and the cap load it's driving. So an intuitive proof is offered here by considering a simplified scenario where we're considering the delay variation in the rising edge of a single-ended inverter or the inputs falling a falling edge with zero fall time and then we consider the propagation delay it takes for that falling edge to propagate to a rising edge at the output crossing the inverter threshold of bdd over two as the supply voltage increases by delta vdd the slope here increases in proportion to the square of delta vdd assuming a square law model for the mosfets and uh, the inverter threshold increases in proportion to delta VDD. So therefore the delay, the time it takes to cross that threshold decreases in proportion to delta VDD. Now you may think this is involving some gross oversimplifications, the zero fall time, the assumption of the square law are obviously simplifications, but nevertheless, this approximation does hold even in advanced technologies over a wide range of conditions. So now let's look at the supply noise induced jitter in a chain of buffers, and that'll give rise to some design guidelines. Supply noise can be thought of as arising from transient currents drawn from a power distribution network, PDN, multiplied by the impedance presented by that power distribution network. Now we'd like that impedance to be very low, but inevitably it will be finite because of series resistance associated with the power distribution and inductance. Now it's possible to come up with accurate estimates of the supply noise using frequency domain methods such as the one described in this paper. We already showed how the PSIJ in an inverter, a single inverter, is related to the supply noise um, it's uh, exposed to uh, by this linear relationship. And it turns out that K can be approximated by this expression here, which has to do with the relative size of the supply voltage and the threshold voltage of the inverter's constituent transistors. So since each inverter introduces a certain amount of PSIJ proportional to the supply noise it's exposed to, if we ex assume that a chain of inverters is all exposed to the same supply noise, delta VDD, then we'll simply see a total PSIJ that's proportional to the number of stages. Every stage we add of inverters can add another increment of jitter. So this gives rise to some guidelines for the design of uh, such clock distribution networks. To reduce the total PSIJ accumulation, we want to use fewer buffers, right? Because total PSIJ is proportional to n. We want to maintain sharp edges because the PSIJ of each inverter is proportional to its delay time. So less delay time through each inverter will give us um, less delay variation. Obviously, we want to make sure that the supply is tightly regulated as much as we can so that delta VDD is small. And uh, to the extent possible, we would like to have a large difference between VDD and the threshold voltage of the constituent transistors, although that may be governed by the CMOS technology that we're in. Random jitter is a different source of jitter in clock distribution networks that originates from the intrinsic thermal noise in the MOSFETs of the inverter. So here we consider this toy example again with an ideal falling edge and look at the rising edge, which we previously used a piecewise linear approximation for shown in blue. But the reality is due to thermal noise, the waveform will be noisier than that. And the threshold crushing crossing time will deviate from its ideal value on each transition due to that thermal noise. That deviation is random jitter, which we typically quantify according to the standard deviation of the crossing time from its ideal value. Um, now that deviation is going to be uh, proportional to the time delay through the inverter, because if we have a longer time delay, we've got a gentler slope here. So the same amount of voltage noise will give rise to more timing noise. Similarly, it's inversely proportional to the current drawn by the 
transistor that's turned on. In this case, it's the PMOS pull-up transistor. Because again, more current, we'll get a faster rising edge here, and that'll tighten up the random jitter distribution. Since the jitter introduced by each inverter in a chain of inverters is independent of each other, a random jitter accumulates according in a sum of squares fashion. So the total jitter, RMS jitter in a chain of inverters is proportional to the square root of the number of inverters in the chain. So given all this, we can again arrive at some design guidelines to reduce the total accumulation of RJ along a chain of inverters in CMOS clock distribution network. We wanna maintain sharp edges again, right? Because jitter is proportional to the rise and fall times of the inverters. We wanna use bigger, stronger buffers so that I is larger. That will also reduce jitter. And again, we want to use fewer buffers. So a lot of the same recommendations for reducing PSIJ will also help us reduce RJ. In general, the trend here is towards fewer and larger buffers with sharp rise and fall times. Now let's look at jitter amplification down a chain of CMOS inverters, defined as the ratio of the RMS or peak to peak jitter at a certain point of the clock distribution network, usually an endpoint to the RMS or peak-to-peak -peak jitter of the input clock. Let's define the jitter amplification factor as the ratio of the input and output clock jitters. And jitter amplification arises from the transfer characteristic of the clock path, even without considering other jitter sources such as power supply induced noise or the thermal noise of the intervening buffers, we may generally see jitter at the input get amplified as we go down a chain of inverters. To develop an intuitive understanding for jitter amplification, let's consider the jitter impulse response. This is what happens when we take an input clock shown in black and introduce just a shift in one edge of the input clock shown here in gray. Now that will certainly give rise to a shift in the corresponding edge of the output clock of the clock distribution network. But in the case of jitter amplification, it will likely also result in a shift in subsequent edges of the clock. The jitter impulse response is the sequence of time deviations for each edge of the output clock resulting from a single impulsive jitter event at the input clock. The input output phase response of a clock path can be assumed to be linear so long as the jitters are relatively small so that for an arbitrary sequence of input jitter, the output jitter sequence is a linear convolution of that input jitter sequence and the jitter impulse response. Let's consider an example with five CMOS buffers in series, driving a wire load, having significant RC time constant at a clock frequency of 10 gigahertz. Jitter impulse shown here in blue at the clock source results in larger jitter at the local edge and also non-zero jitter at subsequent edges. Now, if we have a more general jitter pattern at the input, it's quite likely that sometimes jitter on subsequent edge of the input clock would add constructively with jitter caused by this previous edge and result in jitter amplification. This is particularly evident when the rise fall time of the CMOS buffers in the chain don't allow for complete settling. So for example, as shown here, this falling edge gives rise to falling edge jitter at the output clock, but also an early edge on the subsequent rising edge and then a slightly late edge on the next falling edge. So the jitter impulse response has this ringing style characteristic with the main jitter event happening here and then subsequently a sort of high pass type jitter impulse response. Indeed the jitter transfer function of this clock network has a high pass response which means that high frequency jitter such as particularly duty cycle distortion will be significantly amplified through this clock distribution network. Overall amplification of RJ is gonna depend on the spectrum of the input RJ phase noise. So for example, let's assume we have an input clock with one picosecond RMS RJ, but depending on the bandwidth over which that one picosecond of RJ is contained, we will see different amounts of jitter amplification. If the band, the RJ is confined mostly to low frequencies, we will see very little uh, jitter amplification down the chain. But as there's more and more 
high frequency phase noise, the jitter is amplified more and more by the high pass jitter impulse response. Here's a more specific example of a 10 gigahertz clock distribution network in 16 nanometer CMOS. Let's say we want to distribute the clock a total distance of two millimeters and make it arrive at 10 local buffers, each of which are spaced 200 microns apart along this clock distribution spine. There's a number of different ways we can do it. We can have just two stages, that is two very large buffers, each driving one millimeter of transmission line. We can have three stages or five stages, each driving 400 micrometers, 10 stages, each driving 200 micrometers. For each of these cases, we can observe the jitter at the outputs of these local buffers, which is where we assume that we're actually using the clock. And let's see what the various trade-offs are. If we look at the worst case PSIJ and RJ at any one of the 10 tapping points along this clock distribution network, as we vary the number of buffers that we insert and the size of each buffer, we can see a few key trends. As expected, both PSIJ and RJ improve with larger buffers because we're gonna have faster rise and fall times in each case. Secondly, we see that PSIJ consistently gets worse as we add more and more buffers because each buffer introduces more PSIJ. For RJ, we see as we go from two to five stages, more global buffers sharpen the edges and reduce the RJ contribution of the local buffers. But as we go from five to 20 stages, more buffers don't improve the edge rate that much. And instead, the accumulation of RJ caused by adding more and more buffers in series becomes more significant and the RJ actually degrades. So there's a kind of a sweet spot in terms of the number of buffers we wanna to use to distribute a clock along this two millimeter length. It turns out in this case, it's five buffers. Now let's look at the jitter amplification factor along a two millimeter clock distribution network. So here we're plotting the jitter amplification factor versus the wire length per stage. As we go farther and farther with each buffer stage, we need fewer and fewer buffers. And we've already talked about how that may improve power supply induced jitter and RJ. However, we see that if we have too few buffers and try to go too far with each buffer, we start introducing jitter amplification. And that's gonna be because either transmission line effects are arising or the buffer is simply not strong enough to drive the resulting capacitive load. And so we have incomplete settling of the clock waveform and that leads to some jitter amplification. We also see that the maximum wire length that can be driven by a single stage gets shorter as we increase the clock frequency, in this case from 10 gigahertz to 14 gigahertz. So we really want to avoid the knee in this curve because you see the jitter amplification factor increases quickly and dramatically if we try and go too far with a single buffer stage. There's a test chip that we developed um, to illustrate some of these design trade-offs and clock distribution networks. Um, and here we're considering only two cases, 10 buffers for two millimeter distribution and five buffers for two millimeter distribution. But with the five, in the five buffer case, they're sized slightly larger. So interestingly, you see here that although they're sized larger, they're not double sized. So we're still burning slightly less power in the five buffer case, but nevertheless, we see less power supply induced jitter with 20 millivolts peak to peak supply noise introduced. Uh, slightly less RJ, although you could say it's effectively the same amount of RJ being generated along the five buffer case. And essentially the same jitter amplification. We have slightly more jitter amplification in the five buffer case, but we're still below the knee in that curve. So um, overall, clearly the five buffer case here is better. You take that power savings and the reduction in PSIJ um, any day. Here's the layout of the test chip in 15 nanometer CMOS. More details are provided in this publication. And here are the measurement results confirming the trend. We see the five buffer case exhibits significantly less PSIJ at all tapping points along the clock distribution network. So the key takeaway point here is that fewer and larger buffers can provide some benefit in a CMOS clock distribution network, but we need to ensure that the Transmission line effects or RC time constants of the interconnect don't limit the clock performance.